Great. So Dr. Tom McGill of Ray, um, our Chief of Cardiac Surgery and Thoracic Transplant, is going to talk, um, move on with the vascular disease session and talk about thoracic um, aortic uh, problems. So. Don't forget about pulmonary embolectomy for, for uh, <clears throat> some of the difficult to treat patients. Actually, is uh, safer than you think and uh, very effective. So I'm going to talk about uh, thoracic uh, aortic disease, mostly focusing on aneurysms and dissections. Uh, so aortic aneurysms, uh, one of the things that's really changed uh, has been imaging, and it allows us to not only diagnose aneurysms, but, uh, but follow their growth. And that, uh, on gen uh, in, uh, in average, uh, ascending aortas uh, tend to dilate at a rate of about a little more than 0.1 uh, centimeters per year. The descending aorta tends to dilate a little bit faster, about 0.3 centimeters uh, per year on, uh, on average. And as I said, I mean, it's really incredible how much imaging has changed, that we can follow these uh, patients very, very closely uh, with, uh, with more and more, less and less uh, radiation risk uh, by CT and certainly by uh, MRI. Uh, what hasn't changed is the bigger these aneurysms get, uh, the more likely uh, patients are to have problems, uh, whether those problems be uh, rupture, dissection, uh, uh, and a uh, combination of those together or death, to the point that once you get uh, to be six centimeters uh, or greater, the, the risk of uh, any combination of rupture, dissection, or death is about 16% per year. So it's pretty high. Um, the indications for intervention on aneurysms, uh, these are uh, all in your guidelines, are 5.5 uh, centimeters or greater in the absence of a connective tissue disease. Uh, there's a lot of controversy and discussion about whether the size of the patient should be factored into it, whether you should index it. Uh, the answer to that is probably, uh, but the, uh, the guidelines go by uh, absolute size. Th that's not a great way. I mean, there's, there are patients that rupture when they're smaller than that. There are patients that don't rupture when they're bigger than that. Uh, there are, I'm sure, uh, and we're learning more, that the dynamic aspects of what happens inside the aorta and the wall forces probably play a bigger role uh, than we know, but uh, we really don't know how to interpret those yet. For patients with connective tissue diseases, and there are a lot, and probably as we uh, uh, teases out more and more. Most of the patients that have aneurysms have some kind of abnormality uh, in their connective tissue. But uh, the, for now, the named connective tissue diseases will uh, recommend that you go at a lower threshold, certainly for diseases like uh, Lowy's Dietz or Ehlers Danlos. Uh, some would argue even the presence of uh, dilation of the aorta uh, should be an indication to proceed. Patients with Marfan's uh, still uh, somewhere between 4.5 and 5. Bicuspid aortic valve, very uh, debatable issue. Uh, and that continues to be a moving target, but a lot of us recommend at 5 centimeters or greater uh, to go ahead and uh, intervene. The other thing that happens with a certainly ascending aortic and aortic root problems are the risk of aortic valve insufficiency, uh, not because of a aortic valve problem, but because of the geometry that changes from the aneurysm uh, causing aortic insufficiency. So increasing in the degree of aortic regurgitation uh, with uh, dilation of the aorta, uh, even the sonotubular junction should be a reason to proceed with resection. In the ascending aorta, there's, depending upon, we, we at least uh, most of us think about the aorta now as a segmental organ, uh, the aortic root, the ascending aorta, the arch, uh, the descending aorta and the thoracoabdominal aorta and the intraabdominal aorta. And you essentially uh, think about it in a modular way. You fix what is broken, uh, no more and no less. So for the ascending aorta, uh, oftentimes for uh, ascending aortic aneurysm, you just do a super coronary graft, replace the tubular portion of the ascending aorta. If it involves the root, historically, we have done a composite aortic root replacement, take out the root and replace the valve, even if the valve is uh, normal in the old days. But now more and more, we're able to resect the root if it's diseased or uh, dissected 
but leave the patient's native valve and that the long-term, certainly the intermediate term uh, valve function has been quite good. Uh, you can take the ascending urine out with a, uh, with a clamp on it. This is with an open distal anastomosis. Those little metal bulldog clamps are on the arch vessels. Uh, it allows you to get uh, into the proximal aortic arch uh, while you're uh, either on circulatory arrest uh, or uh, uh, now uh, uh, most of us would do some kind of cerebral perfusion during uh, an open distal anastomosis. This is a total arch replacement. We've resected the arch uh, in a looking down the barrel of the descending aorta. Uh, that catheter is in the descending aorta. And we can reconstruct the uh, aortic arch and the branch vessels, those uh, three up on top, uh, and that longer uh, side branches, what's connecting the patient to the heart-lung machine uh, until we uh, separate from bypass. Um, I said most of the time, I mean, all of these ascending aortic operations are done on bypass. If you, uh, depending upon how much of the aorta you're going to take out, um, you can uh, cool the patient down. The reason to cool people down is every 10 degrees colder you get, you decrease the metabolism of that organ, uh, most importantly, the brain, by 50%. Uh, so uh, uh, moderate hypothermia between 24 and 28 deep hypothermia, 18 to 24, and profound hypothermia, less than uh, 18 degrees. Um, that uh, profound hypothermia used to be the only real way of uh, protecting the brain. As you know, once you start to get above four or five minutes, you begin to have permanent irreversible brain damage. There's not a lot of surgery you can do on the arch in less than four to five minutes. Uh, but if you, if you go to 18 degrees and use that as your only period of time, you have about 30 minutes, which uh, uh, still is not a lot of time, but you can do it. You can add uh, integrate or retrograde through perfusion, and that will extend your time upwards of an hour or more and allow you to do more, complica more complex surgery. Uh, aortic dissection, um, very, uh, very bad disease to say the least. It's the most common uh, uh, problem of the aorta. Uh, I'll say that again, it's the most common problem of the aorta. Uh, causes more deaths than ruptured aneurysms. Uh, the incidence is about three per 100,000 a year. As I said, the most common catastrophe of the aorta. And, uh, and certainly for type A aortic dissections, the mortality goes up with every hour. Uh, most of the patients, uh, or certainly many of the patients, will die before they get to the hospital. And it, they're very commonly misdiagnosed as having a massive MI. Somebody gets chest pain, they hold their chest, and they collapse. They come to the emergency room and they're dead. Somebody oh, they must have had a big MI. There's a study about 25 or 30 years ago that showed that about 30% of those actually had aortic dissections. It's very important to make the diagnosis. These patients can have uh, sort of the uh, most of the time, their presenting symptoms are different from patients with MIs. These patients have terrible tearing, ripping, awful, terrible pain, as opposed to the tightness, uh, uh, pressure that people have uh, with, uh, with coronary ischemia. Uh, there are several different uh, classification systems. If you're in Houston, you still go by the DeBakey criteria. Uh, DeBakey type 1 involves the ascending aorta arch and descending aorta. DeBakey type 2, just the ascending aorta, and DeBakey type 3, just the descending aorta. Uh, early on, it was uh, even more subclassified as to where the, uh, the intimal tear was. Uh, that we don't really focus on as much uh, anymore. A simplified version, uh, the Stanford criteria, if it involves the ascending aorta, it's a type A. Uh, if it doesn't involve the ascending aorta, it's a type B. So if it starts in your aortic arch and goes, if it's in your aortic arch and you're descending aorta, it's a type B. Good job. Uh, and it's about, about uh, two-thirds of dissections are type A dissections, uh, and one, a little more than one-third are type B dissections. Uh, as I said, the presentation of both uh, uh, predominantly is significant pain. Uh, type A, uh, and the patients will tell you commonly, it starts in the chest, went up to my neck, uh, it's in my back and going down to my abdomen. And it's a light switch. One minute 
at least symptomatically, they're fine, and the next minute they're in terrible pain. Type B dissection commonly will start with just uh, back uh, pain. Uh, it's also uh, uh, common for these people to develop uh, perfusion, I mean malperfusion syndromes, and that can also add and complicate the presentation. Uh, you will have patients that do have retro uh, dissection into their coronary arteries and have a, uh, coronary ischemic pain and EKG changes. Not uncommonly, they'll show up to an emergency room and, and be brought to the cath lab or given systemic thrombolysis, uh, which makes um, operating on them a little bit of a, of a challenge. Uh, the initial management, obviously the ABCs. Uh, get if you, if you have a very low threshold to suspect that somebody has a dissection based on their presentation, uh, put in an arterial line and start anti-impulse therapy. That's not antihypertensive therapy, anti-impulse therapy. Don't put them on vasodilators. That'll increase the shear forces in the aorta and increase the risk uh, that they will rupture. So beta blockade, calcium channel blockers. Uh, be careful, a, a lot of these patients uh, will develop aortic regurgitation, so you don't want to over beta block them. Take out a stethoscope or, or have, do an echo to look at the degree of aortic insufficiency uh, and that can, uh, if, you, if you have a significant amount of uh, aortic regurgitation, you can uh, make that worse with increasing the beta blockade. Patients with acute type A, the treatment is surgery. Uh, uh, they really need to go to surgery as quickly as possible. Uh, complicated type B, uh, some kind of uh, intervention uh, is indicated. Uh, right now, anyway, for uncomplicated type B, and we'll talk about what that is, in a moment, um, optimal medical therapy uh, seems to be the right therapy. This is a graph from the IRAD uh, database showing the mortality of an acute type A aortic dissection. Uh, the mortality significantly rises within a very short period of time. These are not patients, I mean, I, I used to tell my residents, a patient with a type A dissection, you want to think of it as a hand grenade in your hand with the pin pulled out. You want that patient to get to surgery as quickly as possible. I have, in my experience, seen patients waiting for another CT scan, waiting for TE to come down, you know, waiting for an operating room to open up that just rupture and die in the emergency room, and that's really a terrible, terrible thing. The goal of the surgical treatment is uh, simply to keep the patient from dying. It's not to resect all of the dissection. Uh, most, of the com most of the reasons that patients with a type A dissection will die uh, happen because of problems in the ascending aorta. Uh, they can rupture, causing exsanguination or uh, tamponade. Uh, they can have uh, uh, retrograde dissection across uh, into the aortic root and cause aortic insufficiency and die of acute uh, heart failure or malperfusion syndromes to the coronary arteries, to the brain, uh, to uh, anywhere in the uh, uh, splanchnic system uh, uh, and uh, uh, increase the incidence of death. So if you replace the ascending aorta, that uh, you can reverse uh, uh, most of those problems about 75 to 80 percent uh, of the time. Still, the mortality rate is pretty high in the IRAD database. Uh, the most recent report is uh, the surgical uh, mortality is still about 20 percent for an acute type A dissection. That varies uh, centers that have a lot of experience, which is a very small number of centers. Um, their uh, mortality rate is lower. Uh, and it speaks, I think, to the benefit of having uh, an experienced team. Type B dissections, uh, th those that uh, uh, are in the descending uh, aorta, uh, we consider those to be complicated or uncomplicated. Uh, uncomplicated dissections have stable hemodynamics. There's no uh, evidence of clinical malperfusion, and you can control the pain uh, with uh, antihypertensive therapy uh, and some pain medicine. And that makes up about 75% of type B dissections. Complicated dissections, those are uh, leaking or, uh, or ruptured. Uh, patients with refractory uh, hypertension those that are undergoing rapid aneurysmal uh, dilation, uh, or in spite of having uh, aggressive medical therapy, can't uh, have their pain controlled. 
uh, and again, those who have malperfusion syndrome. Uh, type B dissections can be, uh, uh, in addition, uh, go on to have a retrograde dissection and, and become a type A dissection. And again, those patients should go uh, promptly to surgery to have their type A dissection uh, fixed. Uh, there are some patients that will develop spinal cord paralysis as a complication of their dissection uh, and become paralyzed. Uh, the, the, the ischemic gut, uh, renal failure, uh, it can be a little bit confusing, the renal dysfunction part of it, because they can also uh, develop uh, AKI, not only from malperfusion, but hypotension uh, from either the disease or the treatment, uh, as well as contrast nephropathy. Uh, unlike type A dissection, which the main uh, management is surgery, type B dissection uh, is optimal medical therapy in uncomplicated type B. Early on, uh, we used to operate on these patients uh, and found that their operative mortality was higher than treating them with medicine. Uh, so uh, we uh, had reserved surgery for treating the complications uh, of uh, type B dissections. Uh, with the uh, advent and I would say the advancement of TVAR, uh, the interest in uh, using TVAR not only for, uh, certainly for uh, complicated dissections, but even uncomplicated dissections, uh, that thinking uh, is evolving and changing. Uh, the benefits of TVAR is you can uh, uh, close the entry tear, the main entry tear, and redirect flow uh, through the true lumen. Uh, that um, should and does, in many cases, remodel the aorta and allow uh, not only the uh, uh, ratio of the false to true lumen change, but also decrease the overall size uh, of the aorta that's dissected uh, and decrease the need for further intervention. There are risks to it, uh, still has a pretty high risk uh, of a retrograde type A, turning a stable type B dissection into an unstable type A dissection. Uh, there is an incidence of uh, paralysis. Uh, patients that uh, do have TVAR uh, should have uh, optimal spinal cord protection, place a place spinal drain, uh, optimize their spinal perfusion pressure because the risk of paralysis is high. Um, and certainly in patients who have uh, dissections that go into their abdominal component, uh, TVAR has been shown to uh, cause new entry tears and, in, and accelerate the risk of aneurysmal degeneration in the abdominal component. There was a study that was reported, the uh, INSTEAD trial, uh, back um, uh, in uh, about 10 years ago. And, uh, sorry, that's uh, my slides. Uh, but the, the early results of that trial show that actually there was no difference in optimal medical therapy versus TVAR. And so that the result of that was that TVAR didn't really have uh, a role in the treatment of uncomplicated dissection. Uh, the instead XL trial, where they followed those patients further out and demonstrated that those patients that we thought on optimal medical therapy who were doing well up to two years, as you get beyond that, and this, that's this graph here, that the incidence of death and aortic-related death increases over time. And so that perhaps uh, these patients would indeed benefit from getting a uh, TVAR early on, uh, either in the subacute phase or even in the acute phase. The further out you go uh, into the chronic phase, the more difficult it is to get a, uh, uh, a successful and durable repair uh, with TVAR. Uh, briefly, thoracoabdominal aneurysms, uh, uh, which are uh, generally uh, uh, atherosclerotic aneurysms in older patients or patients, younger patients with connective tissue disorders. There is a uh, classification system that was described by Dr. Um, uh, Crawford. Uh, the uh, extent one uh, is the descending order from the left subclavian down to the celiac artery. Extent two. Uh, from the left subclavian down into the uh, visceral component down to the iliac bifurcation. Uh, extent three, uh, from the mid-descending aorta uh, down into the visceral segment to the bifurcation. And extent four, uh, from the celiac artery down to the, uh, 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 to the, to the bifurcation. There's actually an extent five now, which is in the mid portion uh, involving uh, the 
uh, visceral components. <clears throat> the uh, treatment for these, and, and the extent has to do with how you uh, uh, plan the uh, operations for them. They're big operations uh, in oftentimes older, uh, sicker patients. Uh, and it involves um, uh, uh, trying to, uh, when you plan the operation, decrease the risk of stroke, a big problem of decreasing the risk of paralysis. The uh, perfusion to the spinal cord is pretty complicated, uh, and it comes from uh, branches of the basilar artery uh, and uh, the artery of Ademkowitz, as uh, you probably all uh, painfully remember from medical school, uh, comes off uh, uh, variably in, from the uh, intercostal arteries, uh, somewhere between uh, uh, T8 and uh, L2, uh, so that uh, um, depending upon the disease, uh, do try very hard to reimplant some of those critical intercostal arteries and then reimplant the visceral and renal uh, arteries as well. Uh, as I said, these are big operations that carry with them uh, potentially big complications, uh, including a mortality of somewhere in the mid to high single or low uh, double digit uh, numbers, depending upon uh, the extent, the risk of paralysis. Uh, we have a, 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 a lot of ways to try to decrease the risk of paralysis, uh, but it's still reasonably, uh, or you could say unreasonably high. At risk of stroke, all these, or most of these patients have atherosclerotic disease, not only in their aorta, but also uh, in their cerebrovascular system. Uh, very important to follow these patients up, and uh, there are guidelines. Uh, do you want to image these patients uh, frequently? Uh, patients who have dissection, as we say, it's the gift that keeps on giving, that uh, once you have an aortic dissection, you have to worry uh, that they will go on to develop either uh, aneurysmal degeneration or uh, re-dissections uh, of the aorta or part of their branches and develop malperfusion. So uh, pay attention to their medical therapy and uh, uh, the uh, uh, imaging uh, scheduling. So with, uh, with that, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of advances, certainly in the last uh, 25 years, for the treatment of thoracic aortic disease, and I would say largely due to the advances in imaging. Uh, we have a lot of ways now to protect the brain and the spinal cord that have decreased uh, but not eliminated uh, the risk. I would say that uh, the uh, explosion of endovascular therapies uh, offers a really uh, 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 I didn't even get into fenestrated uh, uh, stent grafts, but, uh, but really uh, uh, will, uh, I think, open up a new avenue to treat these patients. So I'm happy to answer any uh, questions.